a lot of gigs. <laughs> they're on the road constantly, and they were just taking each town by storm, selling it out and moving on, and then coming back and playing bigger places. And the press were almost running to catch up. Um, none, of, none of our bands really changed the world until Oasis came along, and then everything just clicked into place. Suddenly you had a band saying, I'm a rock and roll star, and, and, and um, that was perfect for creation. I mean, that was like Alan's wet dream. Because I went up to Mark Coyle and said, can I uh, talk to the manager? And he went, I'll go and get this guy, Noel, who d does this, uh, the business for them. So we did four songs, and we came off stage. Unbeknown to us, Alan McGee was just stood there with his hand out, and he went, all right, man, have you guys got a record deal? He said, no. He says, do you just want one? So he said, hey, where have you went? Creation. He said, that's a song. <laughs> it was just, a, just an exciting time for the label, really. And we loved being on Creation. I loved every minute of me being on Creation Records. It's the greatest fucking record label you could ever wish to be on. And all the people that work there, they were real down-to-earth, fucking beautiful madheads, all of them. I think the great thing from our point of view is that Croatia was bankrupt, you know what I mean? That was uh, the untold story there, is that we had no money and we were bullshitting markers and the boys just as much as anybody else. They thought they were bullshitting us. It was like, we're skint, but don't tell them that. This might get everybody paid next month. There was a lot of hope in Oasis, but it, w you know, it was sort of like, Primal Scream was the reason that Sony signed us up. But, I mean, Oasis, it really was like bringing on the substitute and he scored two goals and won the match for us, you know. This one's called Columbia. The white label of Columbia that first come out was what was done in our placky room, which was done on just a little, little task I made track. The original demos today, to me, still have the best attack in the mood you see of any record Oasis has ever recorded. It can, it can sound, it's, it sounds a bit naive sometimes, but it's so strong, it, you know, it's, it's just pure quality all the way. We'd stuck that out and Radio 1 had played that about 20 times. We were sitting in the car and we were going home and the, the Columbia come on. It sounded wicked on the radio considering we only recorded like, our little shitty A track, you know what I mean? You could tell the lyrics were in Liverpool, it's very scarce to say, there we were, but now here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Even then, at that point, I still never thought I've got the biggest group, you know, in the next, you know, five, ten years. It, was, it wasn't that kind of concept. It was more like, well, we can nick them in before a Stone Roses album, maybe sell half a million copies and, you know, we'll, we'll all have ha had a result. We were sent to Liverpool by creation to do some demos and for whatever reason, the stuff that we were doing, it wasn't really happening, and uh, somebody said, well, why don't you just go and write one? Bring It On Down was going to be our first... Um, Alan McGee wanted it to be our first single, and we come here to do that. And uh, we couldn't get... Funnily enough, we couldn't get the drumming right. What I remember from that day is Noel being really busy, sat in the corner, just sort of scribbling away and strumming away, and da -da -da, he was writing these lyrics, and which is what he did, you know, it's like, all right, Noel's doing that. Next thing is like, right in the room, come on, check this out. I was just let there, and I just, I, was, I just wrote the first things that came into my head. And then, oh, just went. There you fucking go, super <laughs> Do that, change there, right, press record, let's go. And we did it, and it was done in the day. And the version that they demoed that day is the version, they've never re-recorded it ever. It, you know, it costs like 200 quid to record it. We left here that night. And listened to it in the car on the way home about 20 times. I was like, fucking hell, man, that sounds mega. Paul Lee, we went, yeah, get on this song. They've just done this today and put it on it. That was the moment we both went, it's, it's got to be unstoppable now. I think a couple of days later, we, we were doing a session in Maida Vale, and uh, Alan McGee turned up. And he was like, well, come on, let's hear this song that you've recorded, you know, 
first single and all that. I've not even heard it. It's supersonic. What's that? I remember playing it through the speakers in Made of Hell, just blew his head up. You need to be you can't be no one else. All of a sudden we were on the word and we were playing live. Oh, you know, and you'd be doing like takes for the camera during the day, I'd be like, that was all right. Maybe doing another one, sound checks, oh, did it all right. So I'm going to get it wrong sometime and it's going to be on this, you know, at the moment. Didn't, thank God. They're fantastic on it. That was their first ever live TV appearance, I'm just sat around going, you know, Liam was probably 20 at the time going, are we going on yet? Can we do it? Come on, come on, let's do it. Can I ride with you in your BMW? You can sell with me in my yellow submarine. You need to buy it now. Cause no one's gonna tell you what I'm on about. The word appearance was, was pretty pivotal in the first sort of few weeks as well. It was like that was made such a big impact. It was almost like it was 3D TV. Liam just seemed to come out of the screen. They always backed it up, you know, they came on telly. People going, oh yeah, this is going to be hooligans and it's going to be rubbish, they're going to be drunk. But, but when there was work to be done, they did the work. In Mona Valley, there was very high spirits, no question about that. They knew, you know, they knew that they were very confident about how good the songs were and how good they were. Down to a studio, you got a couple of weeks in there, big studio, river running through it. It's like, oh, it's amazing. It's going to sound great. And it didn't. It didn't work out. To, you know, it was pretty good, but it wasn't, it wasn't like hitting the ceiling in terms of everyone's expectations. So after a couple of weeks of deliberations, they decided to basically start it all again. It took us three times to do the album. Because it went right, we've got people mixing it. We've got a producer there who's produced the kinks and that. And it went right for us. I think it was the first time we were in a big studio. There was something that wasn't quite happening. It was probably a lack of uh, live performance that hampered them sessions. And we were there for a while, I think we were there. We must have been there for three weeks or something. Um, and there, w there was no live music going on. It was all, you know, it'd be, you know, drums, then bass, then guitar, and, it, and it was, it just, it wasn't what anybody was used to. The drums go in that room or behind that screen, the bass go over there, and, and that kind of thing, which I think weirded them out a little bit. I actually thought when we was in Mono Valley that it sounded all right, but of course I'd never actually heard the band live because I, you know, we were always on stage and he was going, it's just not right, you know. And, uh, and Alan McGee was going, it doesn't sound like you lot. Um, so we were sort of taking their word for it, really. The deliveries was all good, it was just the, it was just the way it was... I, th I think it was just the, 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 you know, the actual vibe of the thing and the way it sounded, it just didn't... It just sounded soft. It didn't sound, you know, there was no edge to it. Just panic stations, you know, listening back to monitor mixes, just going, this ain't happening. Your music's coming out of a speaker which is the size of your fucking house. Yeah, yeah. You know. I mean, it's going to sound great. Yeah. You know, even Frank Zappa. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't in any way representative of what they were at that time. It was a good couple of weeks before it was decided we were going to scrap it, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Because we were in with Dave first, weren't we? We'd, we'd started mixing with Dave. Did we? Right. Yeah. And then, um, and then Angelie came as the... It's not like say, it's sort of like the, the, the safe option from creation, yeah. wasn't it? Noel obviously very worried. I mean, this is songs that he's written, that they're coming out of speak sound like that, not giving him any justice. Come up to Olympic Studios and have a go at mixing this, and if you can't mix it, then nobody can, and it's rubbish, and we're all going to start again. I, I, I think I was given the task of going in and telling Jeremy Pierce at Sony that the forty to fifty thousand pounds that he'd put up to record the Oasis album was uh, going in the bin, essentially, and we needed more money. And he unbelievably went kind of like, yeah, OK, fine. I'll always respect McGee for that. He just said, look, you know, fucking go and do it again. And we're like, you sure? And he was mm. like, just go and do it again, because you've got to get it right. And um, off we went to Cornwall. <laughs> I remember getting on a boat and going to the, the studio. I can't remember anything else. I don't even remember coming back. They didn't tell me. 
that you had to put the gear on a boat to get it there. It were like it would have kept that one as a surprise. I just remember being Quiggs with his bass amp, fucking freezing, middle of January, wind blowing. I remember going, I bet Bono never had to fucking do this. <laughs> Nice middle class girl, you know, and then bang, I was like in the middle of Oasis. Oh, quite frankly, at the beginning I was a little bit scared of them. And I thought, gosh, you know, what's all this? It, it wasn't palatial, no, it's all pretty cramped in and no frills, you know. Tiny room and a pool table, TV room, and that was it, you know. And they were quite funny, they were just like boys that had gone to camp or something for the first time. Yeah, it was like an holiday for us. Just some getting out of the house, that was it. Can I have bangers and mash for my tea, please? That's what they were like, you know, and the, where's the jelly? And I thought I was on a school trip, to be honest. We had it going on pretty, pretty much straight away, didn't we? Absolutely. First day, we're recording straight away. But we set it up in a way that we understood. We just set it up like a rehearsal room or, you know, or like a gig. Just the fact that, you know, each and every one of you were in that room, you could see each other, a lot of eye contact. It was just, it was what we, it's what we always did, playing a room together. They had actually thought exactly about what their sound was supposed to be. I mean, Mark Coyle and Noel had spent years, you know, discussing the fine points of what is great about these things. And they, they liked their orange amps. They wanted it to sound thin and fizzy. I mean, that was the whole idea. I mean, I suppose you could get confused because they wanted Neil Young at the same time. When everything was done live, vocals, everything was done live. Liam was down the end of the room, behind the glass door. I fucking love that, because it looked like he was in prison. <laughs> he'd be there with his headphones on, and he'd be shouting, and he'd be like, I can't, can't fucking hear you. Get on that, I can't hear you. And um, he was just singing there, and then we'd stop, and then we'd either get the thumbs up, and then we'd go, Liam, did you get it? And he, he'd be pretty much, it was like one or two takes, and yeah, it was all right. Yeah. And the technique was three takes of a song, next song, three takes of a song, next song, three takes of a song, next song. It wasn't much more than a week, five days. It was fast. It was a much more comfortable session, really. Uh, everything started to fall into place. We used to play You Wear It Well by Roger Stewart all the time. And there was endless discussion about this 70s drum sound, dry, no reverb, just the room, that solidness of the guitars. When it, when it came to mixing it, you know, we, we, were having, you know, we were having problems mixing it as well. We went up to McGee's flat that night and we'd, we'd been mixing Columbia for about, I think it was about the hundredth mix. And we got there and before we, <laughs> before we pressed play on the tape recorder we said, before we start, this is the fucking bollocks. Wait till you hear this. And if, if you don't fucking like this, me and him are washing our hands of the album and you're going to have to get somebody else to mix it. And it come on and we sat there and the minute it fucking come on, the pair of us just went, it sounds fucking awful. <laughs> 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 it was fucking rubbish. And of course, McGee's like, ah, we're going to have to get someone else to mix it. It was a really balls out rock and roll, really, what, which we, we all wanted, but we kind of didn't know how to kind of get it was always made clear that there was supposed to be leakage. You know, like, if you took an instrument out, you'd still hear it. And this was part of the philosophy. In the end, it went to Owen Morris, and he mixed it, and then it came to life again. In those days, Marcus didn't know anybody fucking else. So he asked me. These days, he knows fucking everybody, so he doesn't ask me anymore, you know, but... Uh... Well, I just turned up in Loco Studios in, in Wales. We did a weekend, we did rock and roll style in Columbia first and Liam had to sing rock and roll star I don't think there was a vocal on it so he sang that just straight off a couple of takes told him he sounded like John Lennon so he thought I was fucking great you know John Lennon and John La John Lydon are the best vocalists and if I'm in somewhere in between I'll be very happy man he was happy no little bit of singing on it and I just mixed it the first factor of definitely maybe that should be acknowledged is Owen Morris really was like he took the record and he really did give it an aggression. Most of the mixing was out of necessity, um, all the ultra compression, so you just get a sort of wall of noise. We were out touring and we would be in the back of the van and the cassettes would turn up by courier from, the, from like our office and it would be mixed a slide away and we'd all stick it on. And it's the only time we've actually given something away to mix and not been involved in any of the mixing. And he sent it back, and we were just going, fucking, that's, that's it. it, that's it. Yeah. Who is he? You know. 
subsequently found out as well, so it's a bit of a disappointment. But... And now that's...